who could know, back in the early 1970s, that what started in a small brick building in Beaver Creek, Ohio, would emerge as an innovative powerhouse in the technology world. The company evolved to be called LexisNexis and would go on to impact the world in powerful ways. From its humble beginnings, this company and its people set the world on a path that led to the information age. Join us for conversations that reveal how this amazing organization evolved and grew. So to help tell the story of LexisNexis, we're going to go back in time and talk a little bit with some folks here who know a lot about LexisNexis. I'm going to bring in my first guest, and that is this young man right here. This is Mr. Keith Hawk. Keith Hawk, say hello. Hello. Good to see everybody here, and thank you for being with us. And what year did you start LexisNexis? Uh, I joined LexisNexis as an employee in 1985, but in 1979, LexisNexis was a customer of mine when I was a sales rep with Ohio Bell slash AT&T, and I was fascinated by the dynamic growth of this young company called Mead Data Central that was clearly prospering and buying lots and lots of things from me and Ohio Bell. And what was your, what was your first title? Uh, well, I came over from Ohio Bell with like, a lot of technical training and knowledge. And at that time, they needed people to do uh, uh, technology training for our sales force and also to interact with our customers as they tried to get LexisNexis into their own internal computer systems. Okay. So I was a technical, uh, technical sales consultant, I believe was the title. The so beginning. you went from technical sales consultant in 1985 to when, did, when you retired a few years ago, what was your final title there? Uh, Senior VP of Sales. Senior VP of Sales. Well, you climbed the ladder a little bit there, Keith. <laughs> it worked out fine. I enjoyed my career at least as much as you, Terry, no doubt. I, it's my well, alma mater, too. So thank you for helping me host this podcast about kind of the history of LexisNexis and the origins. But I think we need to bring on our next guest, and he'll he'll know a lot more about this than we do. So why don't I bring in this young man? His name is Jack Simpson. Jack, how are you? I'm well today. Thank you for asking. And uh, where are you located right now as we speak? In the big city of Alpharetta, Georgia, 20 miles north of Atlanta. And in what year did you join LexisNexis? I joined on June 17th of 1982, and I left in 1992. So 10, 10 years. years. Yeah, okay. And, and your title was president, CEO? What was the actual official title? President. President, president of uh, Mid Data Central. Okay. So we had a little warm up call for those folks watching this uh, about we were talking about how do we approach this topic. And what we decided to do was have Jack do a little explanation of the origin, how LexisNexis actually started. It wasn't LexisNexis. It wasn't me data central. It was what Jack back in the day. Okay. I did a little research, but I had a lot of tribal knowledge. There's a lot of folklore about the beginnings. A lot of people have claimed to be the father of LexisNexis. I think Keith only did. Two that can really say that. Okay. In the beginning, there was a little operation called Data Corporation. It was a, a company, a small company, and it was owned by Bill Gorog and Kyle, Lyle Cahill. And it was in Dayton. And uh, they had all kinds of nice technology hidden underneath it. They had inkjet printers. They had display technology. And in one place, they had an information systems division. And in that division, they were working on search and retrieval software. And they did that because the Air Force needed it to keep up with their procurement contracts. And so uh, based on that, a, another little operation called OBAR, which is Ohio Bar Association, they had all this case law that they wanted to search for their lawyers. And so they started OBAR and basically were funded by donations. And so this was in 1968 and they found uh, Data Corp. They found this little division and they were starting to make progress. They put a lot of data on it, but the thing was so slow, uh, very difficult, but it proved the concept. At that time, I think the concept from OBAR was full text, end user, easy to use, and uh, we don't want 
uh, summaries. We really hope the librarians don't get it, but it's okay. But we want end users. So that was their concept. So uh, Lyle Cahill was a neighbor of Jim McSweeney. Jim McSweeney was the CEO and chairman of Mead. And Mead was one of those, it's a paper company, paper force products. And they were making a lot of money those days. And everybody wanted to be a conglomerate. And they did too. They owned uh, Stanley Furniture, Mogul Coal, Murray Rubber, a lot of stuff. So they were, Jim McSweeney was in the backyard. Lyle Cahill was out there and they talked a little bit. And uh, Lyle described what he was doing. And Jim said, boy, that sure sounds interesting. We don't have any digital technology. We need, we need an uh, entry into that. A week later, they started negotiating for a sale. So I think it was 1968, May or, May or June, and they consummated the deal. Now, Mead bought this for the inkjet technology. That's what they could really see. They understood that. Being the paper business, they like printers. And so the inkjet printing business was, was interesting. They didn't have any real products yet, but they had the technology. So they closed the sale, and uh, Data Corp, under the control of one of the owners who moved over, Bill Korog, became a subsidiary of Mead, Mead Corporation, the big deal. And then Mead sent in people to find out, what do you guys really do? And so they started now researching uh, what was going on. They didn't really know. They had no idea that there was search logic, there was OBAR or any of that stuff. And the Air Force canceled the contract well before this. I think that's what may have driven Data Corp to be willing to sell. Does that make sense so far? So, so far, so good. The, oh, Air hey. Force, the Air Force was really the origin of, of the original entity, Data Corp. Uh, yeah. I don't, was it? Well, I, I'm just, I'm just to, to clarify. Well, the Air Force got it out of it, and and Obar and the and the Data Corp became available due to this backyard fence conversation between right. the media tech and the Data Corp. That, that that led to the whole thing becoming it real. It did. The For backyard me. conversation and Mead buying uh, the, the, the basis of LexisNexis, but they didn't know it, not yet. Yeah, so they then didn't they didn't know about and retrieval much, did they, at that point, the, the Mead folks? Yeah, there was a lot of, lot of surprises going on. So finally, I didn't reference, but keep rolling. As, as quick as they could, they sent in some Mead folks and say, what do you guys do? Uh, what, what are your assets and so forth? And that's when they found this little division that had the search software and was working with OBAR. Well, they thought it was interesting and they weren't making very much money uh, from OBAR. It was, it was piddling. But they said, we like the basis of what you have. So they called in A.D. Little. And A.D. Little was a uh, uh, consulting firm and they would help you understand your business. Now, I might add that the guy running this thing, I haven't told you his name yet, was Richard Gehring. Richard was the guy that, that was running the information systems business, and he worked for Bill Gorog. So nobody knew too much about him, but he was the guy that they all could talk to, Bill Gehring. And I rely on him a lot for, for some of what I've learned. So A.D. Little finally concluded, yeah, we think you've got a business, but the software you've got is not good enough. Uh, the market you got in Ohio is too small. We're going to have to go bigger. And... Uh, we, we need to get after the legal business because at that time, the guys in the information systems uh, division were trying to do newspapers, uh, medical people, everything. And they had a generalized interface and they were trying to get anybody they could to use their search software. I need to get a drink for just a second. Feel free. You're doing great. By the way, how old are you right now, Jack? What, what, what's your current age? Say that again. How old are you now? I'm 82 years old. I'll be 83 in August. You look great. Well, I can still walk, you know, five miles a day. I'm slow. <laughs> so what I, I have stamina to finish, I don't have speed. All That's right. Well, continue on with your story. I'm, I'm the point guard of the Alexis Nexus uh, basketball team, by the way. <laughs> I remember those days. I remember once having a run of, of uh, two field goals and two free throws. And I never had that much in my whole life anywhere. And uh, I never did again. Okay, so now we got A.D. Little coming in. It's A.D. Little Consulting Firm coming in. And they brought in Don Wilson, who was from the Peace Corps. 
They brought in Jerry Rubin, who was a Harvard-trained physicist and lawyer, practicing still, and he's practicing in New York. I don't know why he was messing with A.D. Little. And they brought in a guy named Ed Gotsman, who has Navy training. So those three guys did the evaluation, and they came back to me and says, we think you can build on this, but it's going to cost money. It's going to take some time, 20 to $30 million. So uh, wow. me, you know, thought about it. Again, times were good at that time. And in February of 1970, they broke out this little information systems division and named it Mead Data Central. 1970. February of 1970. That's wow. a key date. Don't forget that. So at that time, uh, I guess they needed a change in management. They brought in the three guys from AD Little. And the, uh, uh, let me think what his name is. Oh, Don Wilson was picked to be president. Jerry Rubin was a part-time executive vice president. And Ed Gossman was a general work on everything. So those three guys came in. And the business at that time still consisted of three major operations. One was they'll take data from anybody. And they were thinking of newspapers, thinking of law firms, thinking of corporations. That was one business, Publish, which we all know how that turned out. They also would be a service bureau. If you don't have any computers, we'll run your data for you. Send us tapes. That's the first time I ever heard of tapes. And they made tapes work in those days. <laughs> and we just got impatient later and had to key everything. But anyway, tapes worked. And the third business was they would install for you uh, your own operation, and you're going to pay something every month for it. And in all three ways, Mead was designed to, to make money, Mead Data Central. So they had three businesses. Well, they had a lot of different personalities in there, a lot of good ideas. They're all uh, pushing around. But the fact of it is Jerry Rubin was a very bright guy, very strong. So at some point, he said, this general interface you've got to serve all these different markets is not good enough. I need something simple for our lawyers to use. I can't use function keys. I need words like page forward, page back, mm -hmm. and I need it to be real easy. And uh, that was his point of view. He said, we're wasting a lot of money on all this stuff. So uh, the, the other guy, which was, uh, what was his name? So Keith, Keith, it could, because you came from the technical uh, area, the, the fact that they decided to design their own terminal, that's kind of how the Ubik came to be, where Bob McConnell... It was super unusual yeah. at, at the time, but but it, outside of the financial industry where people were pulling numbers, I mean, the ability for a lawyer to, to, to touch a keyboard. And by the way, to Jack's point, ha having dedicated function keys like next page, previous page, next document, and so forth, spoke specifically to the lawyer and without that, I don't, I don't see how we would have gotten lawyers to put their hands on the keyboards uh, because back in those days, they didn't have their hands on keyboards. That was seen as an administrative duty. And a big part of the original Lexus Salesforce was bringing lawyers to the keyboard themselves. And, and Jack's point is absolutely right on. Without, without a dedicated device, very much focused on their words and, and, and their functionality they needed. I don't think well, this could have happened. At well, you have to think memory. back then, the modem was probably what 300 bits per second, 300 bits per second. And they had probably had a large desk like device with a, some type of display that was slowly scrolled data across the screen as it would come in. I, I could imagine that that was a miracle back then, but today, could you imagine what people would think as they saw data you could read as it's coming across the screen? <laughs> Jack, you might you might like this. One of my, on my first week on the job when I joined the company, I was in, in charge of the 2400 baud beta test, and what that meant was the screen would fill fill in about seven seconds instead of the 12 seconds that it took at its earlier traditional 1200 bits per second yep. speed. And I would sit with customers and they go, "Oh my God, I can barely read it as it comes across the screen. It's so fast." <laughs> so times have changed. Those, All right, are pioneering, those are pioneering moments. Okay, continue think, on with your story. Okay, oh, I continue think, on with your story. It was 1974 when Mead had their own network and dedicated lines. They worked with AT&T. Eventually, it became 100,000 miles of leased lines. Right. But the concept was when a lawyer sits down and pushes a button, uh, eventually there was a Ubik in 1979. But when you push a button, it wouldn't be auto-dial, and they're online. It was all a local call. 
Nobody was supposed to make long distance or any of that stuff. Of course, this is all years and years before the internet. Right. Oh, yeah. So anyway, there were two, two strong factions inside this little group. And one was led by Jerry, and he was entirely 100% correct on wanting to focus on law first and want it to be easy to use. The other side still had these three different businesses in mind, and they were working with the Boston Globe, with the Philadelphia Inquirer. They were making progress. But uh, after this presentation made it to the Mead Corporation, a big decision was made that we're going to go focus on law. You guys can continue, but we're going to take away most of your funding. And they created uh, a, a, a new focus, and they promoted Jerry in 1971 to be president of the new business because he knew exactly what needed to be done. And he put together a team of, of uh, people I think Mark McGill came in at that time. Henry Hallison was in there. Uh, Bill Thompson, a lot of folks that we knew, knew later on were pioneers in there trying to get this thing off the ground. Well, they were still working on, you know, search and retrieval, easy to use interface, uh, make it for a lawyer. And in May of 1973, they had something to show. At that time, Jerry, uh, who was the leader of the group, knew what he was doing. He named the product Lexus. So Lexus is 1973. They did a demonstration in New York City, and it went okay, but uh, was not very fast. But, but it was enough to that they started uh, buying from him, started creating contracts, the big law firms. Now, Jerry always wanted to be close to his customers, as he should. And he uh, got headquarters placed in New York City. That was the start, I think, of the Pan Am building. They went in the Pan Am building, and the computer operations stayed in the Mead Tower. There was no building one. Stayed in the Mead Tower for a while. So uh, they were they were off and running uh, with the system. So what happened later on is uh, in 1975, some competition emerged. And that was Westlaw. And Westlaw built their system on QuickLaw, which was a, uh, some software up at the University of Toronto, I think. And that had been around from 1968. It had been there a long time. And so uh, QuickLaw was the basis for Westlaw. It was pretty good. They had some great competition. The, uh, remaining, three, the remaining three applications and the guys that liked them, they got a lot of their funding take away. Uh, they went back and the, the, their name was changed to Mead Technology Labs. And they kept working with Boston Globe and different people. And they had contracts. They were installing actively. Well, at some point in time, Bill Gorok said, you know, I think we can do with news what Lexus is doing with law. And he got together a business plan and to focus on news. Well, they took that business plan to Bob O'Hara at the Mead headquarters. And what happened was Bob said, I think you're right, <laughs> but I'm going to take it away from you and give it to the Lexus group. That's where it belongs. So those guys were aghast. Uh, several key guys resigned. That was the end of it. So now we have the basis for Nexus appearing in 1977. And that's where that uh, Newslib was the name of the, of the product they thought they had. So it went in as Newslib. It came out in 1980 as Nexus. Drink water. That's crazy. I love that story. Um, so we're up to, up to 1977. And is Jerry Rubin still president at the time? He's still president. He's president from 71 to 81. Okay. Now, Jerry was a strong guy. He was a smart guy. He knew the market. He was in New York City where all of his customers were. He knew them. And he talked to them. And I think without his influence, there would have been less early usage. The computer systems were down in Dayton and, you know, they were getting things done. I haven't got the date yet for building one, but they needed, clearly, they were bigger than the Mead processing system could handle. So they got their own building, building one, and everything got moved down there. So Newslib is the basis for Nexus. And Nexus was announced in 1980. And uh, it had difficulties from the start and uh, was not profitable and it needed some core information. 
So yet another consultant group is called in, and that's called Boston Consulting Group. And in my first week, shall I tell you about my first week sometime? We're going. Oh, we're almost there. We're, we're going to get. We're going to get to there. Okay. I think that's going to be a, a great focus of this. Okay. All right. Now, so let me go back to 1980. Those ideas that they had about function keys and easy to use stuff and all that didn't get into the market yet until they had the Ubic. And I, the date I have is 1980. I always thought it was much earlier than that. But that's and, and what then, I have. And Bob McConnell's the guy, in, in, as far as I know, that kind of came up with the Ubic concept. And in the conversation. Yeah, and when I guy. talk about my first week, he was the first guy to show up to ask for money. <laughs> that was on day two. <laughs> and on day two, Bob showed up. He was a wild man. I never I never seen anybody like that. But he was smart, and I could tell he was smart. But he had no fear, and uh, he introduced himself. There was no nobody who warned me that he was coming. I mean, he got on my schedule, and so there he was. And uh, I didn't even know what the budget was. I, I barely knew, you know, the financials. I'd looked at them, but uh, I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't have a million dollars. So we, we, we need to back up on that, don't we? Because we want to get to. Yeah, I, I, yeah we'll go back over that. My first I, I, week, I can tell you day by day. Well, I want to I want to I want to get us there. But the way I want to do it is I want to find out how they found you. Right. Bef before we go into Jack Simpson years, I want to talk about the, the status of the company and how they found you, and you were in Texas at, at IBM, right? Yeah, but I haven't talked about Ruben Levin or any of that. Okay. You want that some other time, you want that first? No, no, let's do it now. We're, we're, we're going down the path. Okay, so Jerry Rubin, uh, as I said, had headquarters in New York. Mead never liked that, anybody at Mead, but he reported in to a guy named Bill Womack. Womack had, was the chief strategy guy for the whole Mead Corporation. And Womack was sitting there thinking that when McSweeney retires, which is not long, that I'll get the job. But anyway, he was great cover. He knew how to get along with Jerry. He was very supportive, and they, they did well. But in 1974, uh, Womack uh, resigned. They went on to do something else. Well, that meant Jerry Rubin had to report to somebody, and they picked Bob O'Hara. And Bob O'Hara was a wild man. He's the guy that recruited me. He was, he was a marketing kind of guy. He didn't look like anybody I'd ever seen in Mead. They were a little more quiet, a little more subdued. He was anything but that. He was the 4th of July. So anyway, uh, he and Jerry just couldn't get along, and he did not want to have headquarters in New York. So at some point, it got to a head, and you know the rest is history. In 81, I think in the fall of 81, uh, Jerry was asked to leave and showing more loyalty than I've ever seen anywhere else, Gotsman and Bennett went with him. I've never seen somebody get terminated and key people also go. They need their jobs. They got families. Well, this was a tight knit group of three people and all of them went. Hmm. So there you have it. So they, 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 they didn't have a president. They let Jerry Rubin go. And then they went looking for the next guy. No, so they had Jim Romer. Jim was an Jim operations Romer. guy, I think in the Mead tower. And they said, Jim, will you be the acting general manager? They didn't call him president, at least what I've got. He's going to be the acting general manager. Will you see if he can hold things together? And they did. And so that was from maybe the fall, September of 81 until I came in in June of 82.